All right, so uh, uh, before I be, uh, continue my discussion uh, of the uh, fast that Gandhi had undertaken at Ahmedabad, I just want to take a couple of minutes to show you a few slides. Uh, these are from uh, recent trips uh, to Porbandar, uh, the place where Gandhi was born, uh, Rajkot, the place where Gandhi uh, attended school. Uh, and then on subsequent occasions, I'll show you a few more images uh, of Motihari and uh, the Champaran uh, region. That, by the way, is a correct pronunciation. I've been using the colloquial Champaran, but it's actually Champaran, uh, the place where Gandhi had conducted a Satyagraha campaign uh, in 1917, and which, as I pointed out in my previous lecture, uh, is uh, uh, what can be described as his launching pad uh, in India. This is uh, a, a, a slide of Porbandar, the town where Gandhi was born. Uh, if you go through that passageway, through that gate, you ar arrive at uh, the birthplace, which you'll see shortly. Uh, there's a statue of Gandhi, which is, uh, of course, uh, outside uh, this, uh, uh, the birthplace. Uh, the, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that there is kind of a central square uh, in Porbandar. It's a coastal town. Um, and uh, very typical, I would say, of Indian towns, uh, the same kind of, uh, you, you know, density of population that you see almost everywhere else. Uh, and uh, the Gujaratis, of course, uh, as I've pointed out on several occasions, are certainly known uh, as a mercantile and trading people. But, but if you look at Porbandar, it's not really exceptional in any sense, uh, in any sense of the term. This is his birthplace, uh, now, of course, a national memorial. Uh, and uh, this is the room in which he was born. Uh, I took this photograph when I went there a couple of years ago because I also wanted to sort of look at what the reaction of uh, common people is. Um, so unlike, let's say, museums in India, which are, uh, which are almost deserted, uh, nobody bothers going to museums in India, uh, but that's another long story. Uh, the birthplace of Mohandas Gandhi is certainly visited quite, quite often. Uh, and, uh, because I, I think that uh, even though that they are, as we shall see in due course, uh, many constituencies which are critical of Gandhi, uh, I think for a common people in any case, he is still held to be a figure of extraordinary reverence. And that's the sense that you get when you go to uh, his birthplace. So this, there's, this is the plaque which, uh, which you see in the previous slide on the wall, the birthplace of Mahatma Gandhi. G, G is, by the way, a, a suffix. Uh, that is added to, um, you know, uh, a person's name uh, when you want to pay them respect or when you want to uh, treat them with some honor. But sim very simply, sometimes it's used to address people who are older than uh, yourself, right? So it was in this room exactly uh, the place bearing the swastika mark. There's a place there in that room where Putlibai gave birth to Gandhi. Uh, this is his mother, Putlibai. Uh, so, you know, it's a framed portrait that you're seeing the reflection there. I the, uh, couldn't get a good shot of it. And this is his father, uh, Kaba Gandhi. All right, so uh, th these are from Porbandar. Uh, this is a school. Uh, th what you're seeing is written in Gujarati. Uh, uh, and this is a school that he uh, attended, um, uh, allegedly attended. I, I'm, I, I think that there's some uncertainty uh, so over the middle, it says Mahat Mahatma Gandhi Smriti, uh, so a memorial to, uh, to, to Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, and I think it's a little bit uncertain whether, in fact, he actually attended this, this school or not. But that's certainly what is claimed over there. Uh, this is a picture of schoolgirls uh, in this school. They're sitting on the floor. There are no, there are no tables uh, and chairs at this school. So it's a, it's a state-run school. Uh, and clearly for children who come from uh, lower class families. Um, most uh, well-to-do families would not send their children to this school. Um, and you can see here the, the large uh, assembly hall, if you want to call it that. Uh, the, uh, you can see the paint on the wall uh, is coming off. It's in a state of dilap It's in a dilapidated state. Now, I think you should reflect on what that means, because if, after all, he is the father of the nation, remember that, that Gandhi is the only person in India after whom you have a national holiday, okay? a person who is not a deity. Uh, and if he's the father of the nation, and if they can't put any money 
uh, into institutions associated with him closely, uh, including a school that he allegedly attended, it tells you a lot about Gandhi's reputation in India. In other words, there is a culture of neglect, uh, and in fact you could say deliberate neglect for various reasons. Uh, this is a condition of uh, most schools, in fact I would say that this is much better. Uh, I'm going to try to show you if I can find those files because I've got literally ten, tens of thousands of images. Uh, if I can find uh, a, an image I took of the school that Gandhi founded, a school that he founded in, in, in the Champaran region in Motihari, uh, and it's in such a state of uh, devastation that it's incredible to think that it's even a school actually, right? But nonetheless, anyhow, this is in fact, as I said, better than many of the state-run schools, um, and uh, uh, this is a, a, an image only from a couple of years ago, and there you see the portrait of Gandhi. Uh, the, the children here are being, uh, being fed a diet of nationalism, because here you see an image of uh, an Indian nationalist by the name of Bhagat Singh, and this is the goddess, so you know, Hindu nationalism. Uh, this, is, this is essentially what uh, they're being taught in this school. Uh, anyhow, so just a little idea of that, and then finally the last set of images. This school Gandhi unquestionably did attend, he talks about it. This is the high school, it's called Alfred High School uh, in, in the city of Rajkot, once again, uh, in a much better condition, but it is a high school of course, and, and, it, and the building itself is a building that dates back to the colonial period, uh, and here is the plaque. Um, you know, which, which describes the association of the school, you know, with Gandhi, all right? So now, uh, let me go very quickly to uh, uh, what I had been describing to you before, uh, and namely that uh, we had been discussing the, the labor satyagraha, Ahmedabad labor satyagraha, the dispute between the mill owners and the mill workers, uh, and then in my concluding remarks, uh, in my previous lecture, uh, the point at which I had stopped was I had mentioned to you that the workers that Gandhi is brought in as part of an arbitration board, uh, and the workers decide that they're going to actually take a pledge, uh, and the pledge is that they're not going to go to work, uh, because the management has enforced a lockout, the management only wants to give 20%, and then some of the, the, some of the workers begin to uh, waver, right? They, they, uh, and, and for Gandhi, when you take a pledge, when you take a vow, uh, it is something that is really quite sacred, right? That you have an obligation to adhere to the terms uh, of that pledge. Uh, and so Gandhi goes on a fast. Uh, and then uh, I had sort of given you a brief backdrop. We had spent a few minutes talking about uh, the context of the fast. And I want to remind you what I would mentioned and, and then con uh, conclude my discussion of fasting. So uh, one of the ways I characterized uh, fasting uh, is, to, is to suggest that it is the insertion of the body uh, into the body politic, right? Uh, and then uh, one of the questions I'd raised for you was, well, what made Gandhi think that, boy, that by going on a fast, he could influence people? Uh, is fasting a form of coercion, right? And I had also suggested to you that Gandhi was, in fact, the master of the political fast in the 20th century. Uh, in fact, I think it would be hard to point to anyone uh, in history who so consistently used fasting. Now when I say consistently, uh, I should put that in quotation marks, because fasting is not something that you do uh, just uh, as a whimsical idea, right? Uh, every time you have a grievance or every time there is a movement, you simply don't go on a fast. In fact, fasting is the last step, right? And one, one of the things we have discussed often uh, in, in this class uh, is that when you undertake a campaign, you know, you begin with such things as an inquiry. You go and investigate what the problem is. You hear all sides of, uh, of uh, all sides uh, to the dispute, you know, what their point of view is. Then you try to find a common ground, right? So the importance of negotiation and compromise, ascertaining the truth, all of these are the steps that you would undertake ordinarily. Uh, and then, depending on the nature of the conflict and the nature of the campaign, there might be such things as an economic boycott, for example, or there might be something called non-cooperation. Uh, fasting is really the weapon of last resort. It's the weapon of last resort. Nonetheless, uh, Gandhi did undertake a, a political fast, what we might call, and I want to put the word political in quotation marks here, 
because I'm going to suggest to you that, of course, it's our reading that makes it political. Did Gandhi think of himself as undertaking necessarily a political fast? And why was he undertaking this fast in Ahmedabad? Right? But th those are some of the larger contexts. Now, let me add to that picture a little bit. Um, uh, very often when people look at fasting, they make a distinction between political fasts or public fasts and what you might call ritual or religious or domestic fasts. Right? And, you, and some of you um, may recall from the very first week of my lectures that I had pointed to the influence of his mother, Putlibai, on him, and I had described to you, uh, based on what he says in the autobiography and based on our extrapolation of what he says in the autobiography, uh, that Gandhi uh, observed his mother undertaking a fast. But, but the, the context of those fasts was, of course, quite different, and those are what are sometimes described as ritual or domesticated or, or religious fast. So, you know, she, if a married woman, for example, undertakes a fast, uh, hoping, uh, wishing for the long life of her husband, now, that would be what you might describe as a religious or ritual fast. Right? And Gandhi certainly uh, saw his mother, Putlibai, uh, uh, undertaking such fasts. Uh, and, of course, these fasts are not particular only to the Hindu tradition. I mean, in the Catholic tradition, uh, it is said very often by people who have studied uh, the history of Catholicism, let's say in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, that if you were an observant Catholic, you'd be fasting about 180 days out of 365 because there were so many occasions for fast. Very often a saint's day is a fast, and particularly if that happens to be the saint with which you are most closely associated, then you observe a fast on the saint's day. There's Lent, of course, there, you know, fasting on various other occasions. And, and, and that's very often the distinction made that those are religious fasts, they're ritual fasts, and then they're political fasts. But when we say political, what we mean is that the implications of those were actually political. But now, let me complicate it for you and try to suggest that this distinction may not in fact actually be as watertight as we think. So there's this uh, uh, scholar, uh, Carolyn Bynum. Um, uh, extraordinary scholar of uh, uh, medieval European life, okay? And she, she wrote a book called Holy Fast and Holy Feast about 25 years ago. And one of the things she was trying to understand, and I can tell you about 25 years ago, um, this, the students in this room wouldn't know what was happening here 25 years ago with respect to what I'm talking about, but 25 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about anorexia. You don't hear much about anorexia today, but you heard a lot about anorexia and bulimia, so eating disorders, if I may put it this way, as they were described, uh, and women are particularly prone to these. So women who would go on binge eating, for example, or women who uh, would, would in fact actually uh, induce such forms of dieting that it, they would actually become extraordinarily thin. Okay? Now, uh, one of the things that Carolyn Bynum was arguing was that in fact anorexia has a history in many ways that goes back to the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. That's what she argues. But, but you'll see what, what she's going to do, and I'll, give you, and I'll give you the real illustration here in a moment. So what she was trying to understand was, what were the lives of women in Europe like in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries? Because essentially, every woman was expected to marry and bear children. You marry, you bear children, you take care of the home. That's what the life of a woman is like. Right? And if you wanted to escape that, what did you do? Any idea? What would be the one course of action you could undertake if you wanted to escape that? You became a nun. You became a nun. Right? You joined a, as it were, a monastic order, and if you became a nun, it was understood that you were exempt. Right? Now, so if, a, if there's a woman whose you know, parents want to get her married at all, because that's what's it, considered to be the norm, that a young woman, now she's achieved puberty and gone a little beyond that, now, well, she's going to get married. 
And if the woman doesn't want to get married, well, one thing she can do is she can become a nun or she can make herself unattractive. Make herself unattractive. So you, in fact, become anorexic. Right? You become and you cease to eat. In fact, they, they, she, she gives you life histories of these young women who would cease to eat. And so even at 20, they would actually suffer from amenorrhea. That is, menstruation ceases. Right? Okay? That's what she's describing. And then she says that the other way in which women rebelled, because what she's writing here is a history of women's rebellion. Right? So the other way in which they would rebel, and she actually gives you again accounts of this from medieval sources. Right? So one of the ways in which they would take their revenge on men, for example, is she points out that the only realm in which they exercised some control was the kitchen, the production and distribution of food. And she gives you instances where they would mix their menstrual blood into the food that they were cooking, unknown to their men. Right? right? But you, you see, and you, you, no, you read this and you say, ah, you know. No, no, but what she's trying to point out is that, in fact, we have to read this politically. We have to read this politically. So these women who are fasting, right, who are becoming who are now undergoing amenorrhea, she's saying this is a political act. So now, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to suggest to you, well, when you look at Mohandas Gandhi undertaking a fast in Ahmedabad in 1917, uh, we have to really think of all kinds of complexities, some of which I've already pointed to, but let's take some others. For example... Did Gandhi think that, one of, that if he went on a fast, that, because what does it mean to go on a fast? And what, and what is this fast? This fast is, he says, I refuse to eat until such time as X, Y, Z happens. Whatever it is that you want to happen. Right? He's not putting a limit on the fast. He's not saying, I'm going to fast for 24 hours. It's not like that assignment I gave you. Okay, you know, give up something for 24 hours. No, he says, I'm going to refuse to eat until some conditions have been met or the people who I'm trying to influence. And therefore, you have to ask, who is he trying to influence? That's an important question, right? But this is what he's seeking to do. Now, what made Gandhi think that simply by refusing to eat that he was going to actually move and persuade people, right? And is it the case that this kind of strategy occurs to him, this kind of reasoning about fasting occurs to him because he was living in a country where certainly, at least for the last 100 and 150 years before his time, the country had been racked by famines. There are a great many people who weren't eating anyhow, not because out of choice, simply because they didn't have access to food. How would fasting resonate in a culture where there was ample food, such as, let's say, the United States? Would it resonate in the same way? It's an important question to ask, right? Because that is also part of what we might describe as the context of fasting. And it's very interesting that the two countries where you have the longest history of what you might call political fasting, and now of course you understand what I mean when I say that you have to look at political fasting in a provisional way, because I'm trying to undercut to some extent the distinction between political fasting and ritual or domestic fasting. Right? But assuming that there are some contexts in which that distinction might stay, might be true, there are certainly other contexts in which it may not be true. Right? But keeping that in mind, is it an accident that the two countries in the world which have the most sustained histories of political fasting are Ireland and India. Ireland, a profoundly Catholic country, right? And you know the place of fasting in the Catholic tradition, I've already suggested that. And moreover, Ireland is a country which has had a long history of famines. You know, most of the Irish immigrants to this country came in the wake of what is called the Great Potato Famine in the mid-19th century, which took the lives of a couple of million people in Ireland. Right? And again, 
you know, it's, it's not possible to make an argument where you say that, well, this is demonstrably the case, but we are saying that if you do cultural history and you try to bring in the nuances, then these are some of the considerations that you might want to look at. So Gandhi goes on a fast. Now, who is he trying to influence? Is he trying to influence the mill owners? Or is he trying to influence the workers? Of course, Gandhi says that he was trying to influence the workers, right? So fasting is, and what does it mean to try to seek to influence the workers? These workers have accepted Gandhi as their mentor. They say, okay, we're going to follow your guide. We're going to follow your, your guidance here. And, you, and then they renege on their word. They go back on their word. And Gandhi, of course, feels let down. But Gandhi him, him, it doesn't simply feel let down. His thinking always is that there was some shortcoming in myself which in fact made these workers lose their confidence in me. Right? So I have to undergo fasting as a form of penance, as a form of suffering. And this is why I, I would be very cautious in treating fasting simply as a form of coercion. The critics have said, well, it's a form of fasting. It's a form of, sorry, it's a form of coercion. It's a form of blackmail, right? That Mohandas Gandhi recognizes that, well, he's a well-known man. You know, what if he were to die? Who would, who would bear responsibility? By the way, in 1917, Gandhi going on a fast is very different than Gandhi going on a fast by 1932 when he's a revered figure throughout India and already at that juncture a world historical figure. In 1917, outside of South Africa and some small pockets in Britain, Gandhi was entirely unknown, entirely unknown. No one in the United States would have known of Gandhi in 1917. That was going to change very shortly in just a few years, in just a few years, right? But, and, and I'm saying that had in 1917, if Gandhi was to die, then, you know, there might be, and had he been a world historical figure at that point in time, then there might have been allegations. Well, somebody ought to have done something to save his life. Why didn't the state intervene, etc., etc.? None of this is true in 1917, right? He is not even a national figure, really, at this particular juncture. Right? Right? So, the, so, so you have to think to, to yourself, well, Gandhi goes on a fast. Okay, there's a, you know, he's watched his mother. He understands the Hindu political, in Hindu slash Indian political tradition, right? And even if you take all of that into account, I'm saying that there was a very different element in it. And that is the element of what I'm calling suffering, penance, and purification. That Gandhi says that something has gone wrong here. I want to look deep down into myself. It's a form of cleansing. And you know, fasting is, they recommend it, by the way, even, even some practitioners of modern medicine will sometimes recommend fasting. It's a way of cleansing your body of impurities. You give your body some rest, particularly if you've been overeating over a period of time. Right? So, but here, it's not just simply the cleansing of the body. It's the cleansing of the soul, the cleansing of the soul, where Gandhi says, it's a way for me to now self-introspect to go deep down into myself, and I'm really trying to influence the workers, I'm su suggesting to them as well that you should not have reneged on your pledge. You should not have gone back on your pledge, but because you did, now I have to undergo this act of penance, and you hope that they'll get moved. But the fatal flaw here, as Gandhi himself described it, is that in fact the person, the mill owner, and his sister were on opposing sides. And of course, because Anasuya was, was, you know, this, uh, was uh, the sister of the mill owner and she was supporting Gandhi and the workers, that obviously her brother, the mill owner, would have been influenced by Gandhi's fast, even though Gandhi did not intend to influence him. Right? And this is in part what the critics mean when they say that this might have been, in fact, actually an act of coercion. All right? So these are some of the considerations that we have to think about. And what's going to happen eventually is, you know, you can read about it in the autobiography and a number of other sources, what the outcome is going to be. Um, uh, but the outcome is eventually going to be that, you know, Gandhi is going to, going to halt his fast a few, day, few days because the workers are going to come back and say, well, we're really sorry about having reneged on our pledge. Uh, uh, and Gandhi will then seize his fast. Uh, I think it's in the fourth day or somewhere around that time that he seizes his fast. 
Um, and shortly thereafter, then the arbitration board is going to come down with its decision, which is going to be in favor of the workers. Right? That's going to be the outcome of this. In fact, the Ahmedabad labor satyagraha is also important because uh, it is part of the history of the labor movement in India. In the 20th century, this is one of the inaugural moments in the history of the labor uh, movement um, in India. But one or two last considerations. Right? Um, uh, I've got a line here at the bottom, the sexual politics of fasting. What do I mean by the sexual politics of fasting? Um, if you jump ahead to 1948, 1948-49, Gandhi is assassinated in January 1948 uh, when his assassin is put on, the tr on trial. His assassin is a man by the name of Nathuram Godse. Towards the end of the course, we'll turn to the assassination. Um, and when his assassin is put on trial, he gives a speech in his defense. And one of the things that he says is that I had to kill Gandhi because Gandhi was corrupting India. He was corrupting India partly because he has brought in all of these feminine things into Indian politics. And he says you cannot be a nation state in this world today. You cannot count for a nation state. No one is going to pay you any respect if you're led by a person like Gandhi who thinks that spinning and weaving and fasting are going to rock the boat of politics, right? That's what he says. So he thought that some fasting, well, this is the sort of thing that women do in India. You know, why would a man want to do it? And why would he want to influence the political sphere through fasting? So this is in part what I mean, but of course I've also alluded to it in different ways when I was giving you the example of the argument made by Carolyn Bynum Walker that when you look at such things as anorexia and so on, I mean most of the discussion 25, 30 years ago when everybody was talking about it had to do with you know, media ads where women are, you know, all the supermodels are shown as super thin, you know, the influence of these ads on young women, so forth and so on. It's far more complicated than that. That is one of, the, one of the reasons why I was suggesting to you that, we, that if you were going to look at something like, let's say, uh, anorexia, one would have to really look at the cultural politics of fasting and the place of the body, right? Um, what, what, uh, how does one uh, write the history of the body, particularly when you put the body out in the public realm? Okay? So this is what I call the relationship of the body to the body politic. Now, uh, the Ahmedabad labor satyagraha, this is 1918. Uh, Champaran has been the previous year. At the end of this, there is no question that Gandhi is now getting to be known around the country. And as I put, as I put it to you previously, one of the conundrums for us uh, is the, the fact that, that uh, 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 Gandhi, uh, one of the puzzles, I should say, rather than conundrums, frankly, uh, that one of the puzzles is that there has never been a a fully satisfactory explanation of how it is that Gandhi was able to assume the leadership of the Indian nationalist movement by 1919, right? And to understand that very, very briefly, because again, we're not doing a political history now of all the campaigns, right? That's not our task, and each of those uh, uh, would involve several hours of analysis. Um, but I want to describe to you very briefly the political situation in India, and then I want to turn back to uh, this little text that I'd asked you to read, namely Hind Swaraj and what Gandhi's critique of modernity is. But just let's very briefly try to understand the political situation moving ahead of 1918, right? So 1918 is, of course, also the time that uh, World War I comes to an end. Uh, and I've already uh, described to you the circumstances under which India became involved in the war. Uh, over one million Indians uh, Indian men are going to fight during the war, even though this was not India's war. Uh, now, because India had fought on the side of the British, it was a British colony, um, the, uh, the British government had promised that they would attempt to introduce some measure of self-determination for Indians. Right? So, in, in other words, because Indians had fought in the war, 56,000 plus had given their lives. There was obviously an expectation on the part of Indians that, hey, if we're fighting this war, and this war, this global war is being fought in the name 
of self-determination. Remember Woodrow Wilson and you know the whole claim that World War I was a war really for self-determination. So what about all the people in the world who are being colonized, including the Indians? Well, shouldn't they be amply rewarded? Right? And this is why the Secretary of State for India, a man by the name of Ed, Ed, Edward Montague, Edwin Montague, you know, he issues a proclamation in 1917 saying that His Majesty's government, that is the British government back in, in Britain itself, had decided that they would try to introduce some small measure of self-determination. And when I say some so small measure of self-determination, it does not mean independence. No Britisher, no British official or politician is envisioning something called independence for India. What they're envisioning is, well, maybe Indians can have a slightly bigger role in running their own countries. Maybe there should be more Indians in the Indian civil service. Maybe we should have a timeline that let's say two generations or three generations from now, India can expect a larger dose of self-determination. That it might become something like Canada or New Zealand or Australia, the white colonies that were dominions, right? This is what we're really talking about at this point in time. However, at the end of the war, at the end of the war, what we're going to find instead is that the British are actually going to unleash greater repression. And one of the reasons they're going to unleash, unleash uh, 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 greater repression is because they're going to claim that there are revolutionaries move, revolutionary movements in India. So this is a reference to revolutionary conspiracies in India. They're revolutionary conspiracies against British rule in India, that British officials are being targeted for assassination, that there are some of these revolutionaries who are engaging in acts of violence, uh, for example, sabotage of railway lines. Right? So if you're looking at acts of physical violence, what would be a good illustration of that? You know, you bring down a, a police station, you bomb a police station, or you bring down, uh, 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 you know, some other institution, or you sabotage the railway tracks. Right? Okay, so they appoint a committee. It's called the Rowlett Committee. Uh, and this Rowlett Committee is charged. Uh, Rowlett is the name of the man who heads the commission. Uh, th this is a common practice in the Anglo-American world and in India. When you appoint a commission, usually that commission is named after its chairman. A good illustration for those of you who know American history, the Civil Rights Movement, the Warren Commission, for example, okay? Uh, or the Tower Report, right? Uh, much more recently. So the Rowlett Committee is charged with the task of trying to find out what is the nature of these revolutionary movements. To what extent is, can one say that there is a conspiracy against British rule in India, and if there is one, how should the British actually deal with such a conspiracy, right? That's what, that's what its charge is going to be, and what the Rowlett Committee does is it issues a report. That's what committees of inquiry typically do. The end result is something called a report, right? So they issue a report, and the report has a list of recommendations, and one of the recommendations is that the British government needs to really tighten the screws on these Indian nationalists. For example, uh, the committee recommends the suspen suspension of the right of habeas corpus, right? That is a right to be able to, that if, if there's a charge against you, right, that you have the right to be brought before a magistrate or before a judge and make your case. The right to your life, essentially, right? That the Rowlett Committee is going to make some draconian recommendations. And in response to that, in response to that, Gandhi is going to issue a call for a national day of prayer and resistance, right? He's not issuing a call for, you know, boycotting British institutions. He's not issuing a call that we should go out there and, and sabotage railway lines. He's saying we should have a day of resistance through introspection, through prayer, right? And of course what's going to happen, now this is going to be a characteristic problem of all of these Satyagraha movements, particularly after 1918, 1919, when they began to take on a mass scale. Notice one thing, that thus far, I have spoken to you about two campaigns, but those were extremely local. Local, Champaran. Right? Bihar 
Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Now, when the Rowlett Committee issues its report and they pass a bill, it's called the Rowlett Acts, which are going to then put in these measures of repression. And then Gandhi says, well, we need to, in fact, resist this. But he's now calling upon the nation, the nation, the movement from the local to the national is now taking place. And this is really the first time. And this is what inaugurates Gandhi's entry into national politics in India. Not anymore simply on a provincial or local stage, but rather that he is now addressing the nation. And the fact that he has a confidence to address the nation. Because recall once again that in 1918-19, we're not speaking of a political vacuum in India. I mean, they have been, there's been a nationalist movement around for two, three decades now. There are people of enormous stature, people who today would be, even in the West, much better recognized were it not for the fact that Gandhi, of course, eventually is going to, is going to tower over all of them that all of these people are going to be put in the shadows, so to speak. Right? But he's not working in a political vacuum. And the interesting thing is that he has the confidence where he says, essentially, I'm going to make a call to the nation. And what happens in all of these movements henceforth is that there are people who are not going to be restrained or controlled. Right? That Gandhi might say, I urge you, my fellow countrymen and women, do not undertake acts of violence. But that doesn't mean that everybody's following him. Right? There are people who are tempted to take to violence. And of course, there are, there are also Britishers who are going to overreact. And when the Britishers are going to overreact, there are going to be Indians who are going to overreact in turn. Right? And to cut a long story short, what we're going to find is that there are going to be, in fact, a whole series of disturbances. Now, in the Punjab, in Western India in particular, you have what are called the Punjab disturbances. And the most notorious aspect of the Punjab disturbances is what is known as the Jalnia Wala Bag, Bag massacre, which took place in April 1919. And so what is the Jalnia Wala Bag massacre? Right? Again, what we're interested in is only the details really which would suggest Gandhi's role in this, rather than a long history of the massacre and its after history, as it were. But effectively what happens is, so you have uh, in the city of Amritsar, so this city is a city that is holy to the, the Sikhs in particular, in the city of Amritsar, this is not a very good, uh, uh, let me, all right. Uh, so in the city of Amritsar, uh, which is under the command uh, of uh, General Dyer, okay, General Dyer, uh, he's just the military, the commanding military officer, uh, he's not the lieutenant governor of the Punjab, the Punjab is the province, Punjab is a province, Amritsar is a city there, right, um, uh, Dyer issues a proclamation prohibiting public meetings, and it's not clear how many Indians, in fact, actually knew about this public proclamation. Because you know how they used to do public proclamations, by the way, that, that an official uh, or someone working for the government would go in a bullock cart or atop an uh, animal, usually a mule, okay, right? And by beat of drum, they would go down the city and by beat of drum, they would say, oh, the you know, the military officer or the British government, the British Sarkar, British government has issued a proclamation prohibiting all public meetings. Okay? Prohibiting all public meetings. And of course, you know, you don't know whether they went down every street and alley in the city of Amritsar. They didn't. We know that. It's impossible to have done that. We also know that many of these public meetings are attended by people who don't even live in the city. They have come from outside. In fact, the particular day on which this massacre took place was Besaki Day, which is a big, big spring festival, the New Year festival, right? And to cut a long story short, there are 20,000 Indians who are going to meet it in this place called the Jalnawala Bagh. Uh, there is only one entrance and exit into that garden. 20,000 Indians are gathered there. General Dyer comes with 50 troops. He brings an armored car, 
the armored car cannot be used because the passageway is too narrow and the armored car cannot go through that passage. But the 50 troops go there, they are stationed there and without giving the crowd a warning to disperse, they start firing. And they keep on firing until the ammunition just runs out. Dyer himself admits this because he's going, to be, he's going to be examined by a committee. The British love to have committees and we in India have inherited that practice. Every time there's a little problem, you appoint a committee of inquiry, right? Um, you know, if you want to bury a problem, appoint a committee. That's the general rule, if I, if I may put it this way to you, all right? So they appoint a committee. It's called the Hunter Commission, named after Lord Hunter of Scotland. Um, and Dyer himself is called as a witness and is asked, why did you cease firing? And at what point? He says, I didn't want to cease firing. But I had to cease firing because my troops had run out of ammunition. We didn't have any more bullets left. And so, and remember, there's only one entry and exit. The troops are standing right there, so they, the crowd cannot obviously go through that. There's a wall. They try to jump over the wall. Some people f jump into a well which is 30 feet deep, 30, 40 feet deep. They jump into a well, or of course they die on the spot. And whenever Dyer sees men, women, and children running for the wall so that they can try to climb this wall and get out of the garden, he directs the troops to fire at the wall. Now the British, the official British count is 379 dead. Of course the Indians argue there were over a thousand dead you know so there's always a dispute over numbers as you know in all of these instances that is called the Jalian Wala Bagh massacre now it uh, Gandhi has a huge hand to play in the aftermath in many respects one of the respects in which he has a huge hand to play in the formal sense is that the Indian National Congress which is the political party that was established, recall, in 1885. Uh, and initially when it was founded, it had a membership of about 60 or 70 gentlemen uh, who were all lawyers. Uh, and this is the party that is associated with this nationalist Bal Gangadhar Tilak later on. Uh, Gandhi is eventually going to take over this organization. What this organization is going to do is in the wake of the massacre, they are going to appoint their own committee. They're going to say, we don't trust the British committee, right? We're going to appoint our own committee, and the person who effectively writes the report of the Congress committee is Gandhi, is Gandhi, right? But the other transformation is that henceforth Gandhi is persuaded that what Indians need to do now is not to agitate for their rights as British subjects because thus far he has held to the view. He has held to the view that if Indians want to claim their rights as subjects of the Queen, if they want to have a role, right, they must also perform their duty. So in fact, and this has been of course a point of major criticism of Gandhi, during World War I, Gandhi, even to the point where he actually subjected himself to such pressures that his own health was endangered, he went out into the countryside recruiting people for the war. Now here again we have to try to understand the logic of what is going on because of course the minute you look at that you say to yourself, well that's extraordinarily bizarre. Here's this man who's championing nonviolence and all of that and yet he's going out into the countryside and he's trying to recruit men for the war. Why is he doing that? Because we're going to have to try to understand the distinction that Gandhi is going to make. So I want to suggest two points here. Right? One is Gandhi's argument, which I've already suggested to you, namely that at this point no Indian is effectively really arguing for independence. What you're arguing for is we want equal rights within the empire, within the empire, the British Empire, and India is part of the British Empire. Now, if we want equal rights within the empire, well, should it not be the case that we should go out and also do our duty? If there are 
two, three, five, ten million English men who have gone out to defend the country. Why shouldn't we also be doing our bit? All right? And of course, you could argue that the reasoning is flawed. It's flawed because it's inconsistent with the principles of nonviolence. But this is where the second point comes in, and that is Gandhi's distinction between nonviolence of the weak and nonviolence of the strong. And I want to adumbrate on this distinction. I want to try to suggest to you what exactly it means. In 1857, there was a rebellion, right? which I very briefly mentioned to you in my first or second lecture when I was, when I was trying to suggest the backdrop to the emergence of Gandhi. What was the political history of India like in the mid-19th century? As a consequence of this rebellion, which the British finally repressed, the British passed an arms act, an arms act. And what does the arms act stipulate? Very, very briefly, without getting into any of the nuances, the arms act simply stipulates that Indian civilians may not own guns, that there shall be no private ownership of guns or arms. Right? So if you had to think of a contrast, you should be thinking, of course, of right, the Second Amendment right, in the United States, the one that the NRA swears by. Right? All right? That there shall be no ownership, private ownership of guns, arms, ammunition at all. Now, Gandhi is among those Indians who is going to advocate that this arms act should be overthrown that this is illegal, that this is unacceptable. And again, you have to think to yourself, why would Gandhi argue for such a position given that he's an advocate of nonviolence? And Gandhi's argument is, there is no virtue in being nonviolent when you have no other option in life. There is no virtue. This is what he calls nonviolence of the weak. He says that the only way to, to really demonstrate your fidelity, your adherence to the idea of nonviolence is when you have the ability to actually resort to violence and you, you renounce that ability, you abdicate that ability. All right? That there's no, no test of your adherence to nonviolence if as I've said, you really don't have any other option. Right? And I'm giving it, to you, giving it to you in the blunt form because there are all kinds of nuances. And when we get to the salt march, we're going we're to look at one or two of those nuances at that particular juncture. Right? So this is really his position. And what I'm suggesting to you is that 1919, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre and the Punjab disturbances, this is the turning point. The turning point is that Gandhi will no longer argue for Indians having a place within the empire. He's now going to become an advocate of self-determination. The call for complete independence will not be made at this juncture, but he's no longer really going to be arguing for self-determination. That is the fundamental difference. Okay, and I also want to say, uh, just as a little footnote, because I don't have time to dwell at it, that the Punjab disturbances is a much larger set of political disturbances. The Jallianwala Bagh massacre is only the most notorious uh, and infamous uh, episode within the Punjab disturbances, but there are many other uh, 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 aspects to it as well. All right, so that is the situation that we're talking about. Gandhi issues a call then for a resistance to the Rowlett Committee report. You have the Rowlett Satyagraha, and then you have the Jallianwala Bagh massacre and the Punjab disturbances. And Gandhi is going to be the author of the report. Uh, and it is in the wake of this that what's going to be launched is what is called the non-cooperation movement of 1920. However, we do not want to look at the non-cooperation movement at this juncture. This is what we're going to look at when we look at Gandhi's critique of colonialism. Right? What I want to do, rather, is to turn to something else that has transpired in the meantime. And I want to introduce a new trajectory of thinking for us, 
And that is to look at not only Gandhi's critique of colonialism, which I've been hinting at, and his entry into Indian politics. What I'm interested in is his critique of modernity. And the text for us here today um, is this little pamphlet called Hind Swaraj, okay, uh, published by Navjeevan Publishing House. This is a publishing house that used to have the copyright to all of Gandhi's works. That copyright is now expired, so they're all in the public domain, uh, all of Gandhi's writings. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this publishing house effectively, like many other things, is set up by Gandhi himself. Uh, recall that Gandhi founded and edited four newspapers in his lifetime. And some of these newspapers were published in multiple languages as well. All right. I mean, so, you know, we could do a whole course on Gandhi and journalism. You know, what is his role in the history of journalism in India and worldwide? But anyhow, this uh, little pamphlet, uh, Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule, written in 1908 in Gujarati, his mother tongue, is subsequently translated into English. Uh, in part by Gandhi uh, and his uh, longtime assistant, a uh, person whom he loved as his own son, even more so, Mahadev Desai. Uh, so this book is written in 1908. Uh, it's, it's serialized in Indian opinion, one of the journals, one of the newspapers that Gandhi founded. Then it's translated into English, uh, published as a little pamphlet. Uh, and uh, upon its publication as a pamphlet, it is going to be banned by the British. One of the reports that one of the things you're reading um, for this week is the report of the censor. Okay, uh, this because because it's being made available through the archival material now. The report of the British censor as to why this work was going to be banned. All right. Now uh, this uh, little pamphlet is in the form of a dialogue between someone called the reader and someone called the editor. You must read this work, this is crucial, all right? Uh, and I can assure you that you'll be examined on some aspect of this at some point, all right? Uh, this, uh, because certainly to some people like myself and many others who've been working on Gandhi and anti-colonialism uh, and all of these issues, uh, this pamphlet is in some respects to the, to, um, the uh, you know, our times to, let's say, the late 20th century, uh, the mid 20th century, it is to our times what uh, the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels was to a gen couple of generations before and what it was to people in the West. All right. Uh, and it's certainly the case that for many years, unlike the Communist Manifesto, which went through many editions and was translated uh, into uh, English and Russian uh, and French uh, very soon after it was published and it became uh, an internationally renowned treatise, of course, the master treatise of the movement in some ways, uh, the treatise that, was, that made uh, the ideas of Marx and Engels most accessible to most people, right? That unlike the Communist Manifesto, Hinsuraj really went into obscurity uh, for a long period of time. In fact, uh, the person that Gandhi recognized as his mentor, one of his many mentors, none of them really was, if you ask me, uh, because Gandhi was his own man eventually, but uh, Gopal uh, Krishna Gokhale, uh, who is mentioned by Gandhi himself, and I've mentioned him before, uh, that Gokhale in 1912, so three, four years after this work was written, uh, he said to Gandhi, this work is so embarrassing, I'm quite certain that this work is going to be trashed and it is going to belong to the dustbin of history, right? This was Gokhale's verdict on Hind Swaraj. And certainly for some years, it seemed that that's what would happen. In the last 30, 40 years, people have taken a very different uh, view of it. And now there is a very serious body of scholarship just on this particular uh, pamphlet, okay? Now there are some preliminary questions before we get to the substance of this pamphlet. Why the dialogue form, for example, right? Um, uh, why is it that you have the dialogue form between the reader and the editor? Uh, and what might uh, come to mind when you read something like this? So if you're familiar with the Western intellectual tradition, what would be the most famous illustration of a dialogue? Anybody? Sorry? The Socratic method. The Socratic method. Plato's dialogues, right? 
Plato's dialogues. But you've noticed something in Plato's dialogues, perhaps. If anyone, is anyone, anyone here read The Republic, by the way? The most well-known and the longest of the dialogues? Okay, so you know what? The Republic uh, uh, is a dialogue between Socrates and his interlocutors, right? Thrasymachus and a number of other people, the sophists, as they were called. Right? So it's a dialogue between Socrates and the sophists. But it's not really a dialogue if we use the word dialogue in the modern sense because when two of us have a dialogue, right, the idea is that well, we have an exchange. We have a frank exchange and you know, generally we understand that not all parties to a dialogue, two or more parties to a dialogue will have equal value so to speak. But nonetheless, uh, generally a dialogue means not simply an exchange but there's an assumption of idea, there's an assumption that you know, if the United States enters into a dialogue, let's say with Iran, uh, over the question of nuclear weapons, the idea is that you enter it in good faith. Now, in the Republic, the dialogue is quite different because essentially the idea is to make the sophists look like fools. Right? Socrates is always going to get the upper hand of the dialogue. All right? That's what you have to bear in mind if you're looking at the Western intellectual tradition and the dialogue. Now, there is something of that in here, if you've read it. Okay? The reader and the editor are not really equal. Okay? And the editor, of course, here is Gandhi. The reader, who is the reader? The reader is a person who's saying, I question your views. And who is this person who's questioning his view? These were people who believed in the use of violence, Gandhi encountered them first in London, in London, at what was called the India House. So there were these young men there who basically advocated the use of armed violence to overthrow British rule in India. And Gandhi wants to suggest to them, your views are mistaken. Your views are mistaken, right? So, he, so, so the reader is effectively the advocate of armed violence, Okay? But also a person who believes in modern civilization, believes that Western modern civilization is the most superior civilization ever known you know, to humanity, etc., etc. And then Ed, the editor is Gandhi. But of course there are Indian precedents for that too. So for those of you who know the history of India and you know the early texts, there's a series of texts called the Upanishads. Okay? And these, uh, these are philosophical texts and the Upanishads are written again in the form of a dialogue. There are other contexts too, by the way, in which you can think of a dialogue. For example, a Sunday school catechism. Right? Okay, so if you ever, I, I'm not a Christian, but I know about it. Right? So if you ever, you know, had the fortune or misfortune uh, to have to go to Sunday school, you know, over a period of time, you would know, right? That this is usually the Sunday school catechism was in the form of a dialogue. Right? So there are various kinds of precedents. But the reason why Gandhi is putting it in the form of a dialogue is he's doing something very interesting. He's saying that, look, if I were to give just my argument, then there would be the rejoinders to my argument. And in the, when you do a dialogue, what are you doing? You are already anticipating the rejoinder. Right? So you have a certain view, your, your view is non-violence is the most desirable method. And someone says, well, I object to that. What has non-violence ever achieved? So that's the rejoinder. So he already has the rejoinder, and this is what the dialogue enables him to do. He's saying, I've, I've anticipated all the possible criticisms of my views, and those criticisms are being voiced by someone called the reader. Okay? So that's what you have to think about when you start wading into this text. Now, before moving into the substantive elements of this text, even though this work was written in 1908, Gandhi said to the end of his life, that's 40 years later, almost 40 years later, just a little shy of 40 years, to the end of his life, Gandhi maintained that he adhered to the views that he had expressed in 1908, right? So, you know, in 19, uh, so this particular edition that I have, what it does is it includes the preface to the later editions, 
okay, where he says that, well, you know, these were the views that I had expressed in 1908, and often I've had to change my views, or often I've come around to a very different point of view 10, 15 years later, but not with respect to the views that I expressed in Hind Swaraj. He says that very clearly in 1921, when he writes a preface to a new edition of this book, and then he says that again in 1938, when he writes a preface to yet another edition. And this is what he says, all right, in 1938, 14th July. So this is 30 years after he wrote this. And I want you to I want you to understand that because I have argued previously that sometimes Gandhi was asked, well, you said something in 1905 and then you said something in 15 and 1925 and 1935, which of these views? And Gandhi had said very often that when you see an inconsistency between my statements, take the latest statement to be the expression of my views because I move from truth to truth. But in this case, in the case of Hind Swaraj, Gandhi is very clear that he adheres to the views that he had expressed 30 years ago. And he says, the English edition in 1938, he says, is a translation of the original which was in Gujarati. I might change the language here and there if I had to rewrite the booklet. But after the stormy 30 years through which I have since passed, I have seen nothing to make me alter the views expounded in it. I have seen nothing to make me alter the views expounded in it. Right? So therefore it becomes incumbent on us to understand this work because in some ways you could say it is a manifesto of his worldview. Right? Even though it is a relatively early work. Now, how do we begin to tackle this work and what is it about? Right. Let me begin midstream. Let me begin with a dramatic illustration. So there's a chapter here, all right. Um, and as I said, if you haven't read it, you 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 should read it. It's uh, chapters uh, six, okay. Uh, no, sorry, uh, not chapter six. Chapter nine, the condition of India, railways, okay, railways. And you know that there is a kind of what you might call a diatribe here. So, so the, what appears to be a reckless criticism of the railways, of doctors and lawyers. And he says in so many words that all three of them are absolutely useless. In fact, they are a curse on civilization. Doctors, lawyers and railways. Okay? And so, you know, when you read this work, I mean, I remember the reaction of someone in, here in our midst who had pointed to reading the autobiography and thinking, the guy is crazy. Well, you read this work and you think he's a lunatic. Right? Yeah, that would be sort of the instant reaction. You know, why does he, why is he so agitated about doctors and lawyers? Doesn't he recognize the good that medicine does? You know, and, and how is it that Gandhi end, ends up making a critique of the railways in particular, given, given that no one, okay, actually used the railway network in India as extensively as Gandhi did? How extensive, by the way, was the railway network? This is a map of Indian railways in 1909, around the time that Hind Swaraj was written. Okay, and you, all these lines that you see here, this is the Indian railways. I mean, India had one of the most extensive railway networks in the world. It would have been, uh, uh, in terms of gross mileage, it would have been much larger than Britain, simply because Britain's a smaller country. Britain was better networked, Right? They had a better railway network, but Britain's a much, much smaller. England, right? And even if you include Scotland, you know, the Great Britain, much smaller. The only country of the size of India or larger with which you could have compared the railway network would have been the United States. The United States, not today, of course. I mean, today it's a shambles. The United States doesn't have a railway network. Uh, it's, uh, you know, part, thanks to the automobile industry, of course, but that's a different story. Now, here we are saying that Gandhi uses his railway network extensively in 1909. Okay, and he has, as I've suggested to you, a critique, right? And um, this is what he says. Let me just read it in case you think I'm making it up. If you haven't read the text, just two lines, okay? Chapter 9, 
so H S Hinsura chapter nine. Again, I've given you the chapter rather than the page because you may be working from a different edition. And he says, just a few lines down, quote, railways, lawyers, and doctors have impoverished the country so much so that if we do not wake up in time, we shall be ruined. We shall be ruined. Right? They've impoverished the country. And this is what I mean, that you see, if you're a modern reader, you're thinking to yourself, this man is absolutely a lunatic, right? I mean, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. That's what you think to yourself. And I don't want to try to disabuse you of that notion if you have it, but I'm going to try to make a case for seeing how one would read a text of this kind. What does he really mean? And is it really a contradiction? Right? Because some people will simply go at that elementary level of contradiction and say, oh, I don't even want to talk about it because after all, Gandhi used a railway, so why is he constantly harping on about it, right? Isn't, isn't there a kind of an inconsistency about it? Right? And of course, I think that that's a kind of inconsistency which says that, yeah, simply because I have an iPhone in my pocket, well, therefore, I cannot have a critique of modern digital technologies, right? I mean, that would be absurd. Question? Yeah. Ah, but it may be it may be a little more than rhetorical though, right? I mean, in other words, that would be, if I may put it this way, an easy way out. Right? Yes, it is rhetorical to some extent, but it's not only rhetorical because there's a substantive view involved here. And that's what I want to try to get to if we can, right? Before we do that, let's try to understand what is going on here. The first is, I think we should think of railways. So here, let's take the most positive spin on it. All right. Um, and I want to suggest to you, by the way, that had Gandhi been alive today, so now we have to do a hermeneutic reading. A hermeneutic means we have to put Gandhi in the cycle of interpretation. That's what I mean by hermeneutic reading. That what he said in 1909, so would he have said the same thing today? And the answer is no, he wouldn't have. And the reason he wouldn't have is precisely because it's, it's an illustration I gave you before once of a different kind. When I said that, well, you know, he was an advocate of prohibition, right? He was utterly opposed to the use of alcohol. Now, I'm not suggesting that he would not have been an advocate of prohibition today, but I think he would have been much more concerned about soda drinks today than he would have been about alcohol. Because he would have known that the biggest killer is sugar. It creates the gravest problems that you can think about. Right? And he would have understood, of course, that well, unlike alcohol, for example, there are a whole huge number of people, for whatever reason, religious reasons, you know, you might be a Muslim, you might be a teetotaler, for whatever reason you don't. But soda drinks, well, and the use of sugar in general is widespread, widespread. So you have to, you have, to have a hermeneutic approach, meaning that you have to put him in the cycle of interpretation. He might have been more worried about other forms of transportation today. Okay, but le let's look at it this way. That first we have to think about the idea of journeying. And after all, our own life is itself a form of journey. We are here on earth for a very short period of time, each one of us. In the long span of things, we are here for a very short period of time. The railways is a, is a metaphor for journeying. And you know that there's a whole genre of films. You know, if you, 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 some of you might be familiar, this is an old trope in literature, both in India and in the West as well, and in places such as China, where in journeying, you discover yourself. In journeying, you discover yourself. You know, how many road movies can you think about where you do a long road trip and, and that road, long road trip, you get transformed, okay? 
So it's a metaphor for the idea of journeying, and we have to understand how we, in fact, or each one of us journeys through life, so to speak. Now recall also the personal touch that we would have to give to Gandhi's own interpretation, namely that he's thrown off a railway, right? He's thrown off a train at Peter Maritzburg, an incident discussed in this class and mentioned in Satyagraha in South Africa in his autobiography and this is what brought him to the awareness of something called racism right in South Africa he's thrown off that train right so th so there are various ways in which trains were resonating the railway network was resonating you know that map I showed you of the railway network in India in 1909. You know, Gandhi is aware of that. He's aware of what the railways are doing. Okay? And when he comes back to India, he is told by Gokhale, young man, you've been out of the country for too long. You need to reacquaint yourself with the land of your birth. And so what does Gandhi do? He travels the length and breadth of India on the railways. Traveling third class. That's another interesting thing, you know. Which chapter in itself, but traveling third class because he wants to get to be known uh, to the people, a man of the masses. And let me show you a little, little image here. This is a statue of Mohandas Gandhi outside the railway station. You can read it over there in Wellington, New Zealand. <laughs> All right. Wellington, New Zealand. And there's a plaque behind it which says that the statue was put up of Gandhi, not simply to, uh, to honor Gandhi. The question was, why was it put up outside the railway station? You know, why not put up in a million other places, in some public garden, outside the parliament building? It was put up outside the railway station because the people who put it up, you know, the plaque at the back says, because Gandhi was a man of the masses, who identified with the masses, who traveled with the masses, and who made use of trains. It, it, right? It's extraordinary that, you know, people sitting there in Wellington, somebody there is thinking through the fact that, yes, Gandhi had this long association. So here's this statue uh, of uh, Gandhi in Wellington, New Zealand, right? right? So a man of the masses, that this is how the Indian masses were traveling. And of course, one of the things that the railways did was they, they introduced uh, uh, many new measures in Indian history and culture. They obviously uh, introduced new pilgrimage sites, places that people, you know, found it difficult to go to uh, for pilgrimage, made those places more accessible. Of course, the whole idea of tourist destinations takes on a new life when you have something like the railways, right? Uh, and some people, in fact, argue that railways in India had, in fact, actually uh, broken down the barriers that existed between different castes. You know, again, we have had a discussion of uh, the caste system, a brief discussion, the distinction between different castes, but when you're traveling on the trains, you're all brought together, right? So also some notion of Indian unity that comes about as a consequence of the railways. However, it's very interesting that with all the arguments, my last comment before we conclude for today, and I'll resume my discussion of this in my next lecture, but he says that you know, there are all these people who have been arguing that the railways have done India a lot of good, that the British brought the railways to India. Uh, so when you have a famine, for example, in one part of the country, well, then you can use the railways very quickly to bring food from or grains from an area where there's plenty to an area where it's not plenty, right? That would be an illustration of the good that railways have done. Of course, um, you could also say that you could bring troops from one part of the country to another part of the country to put down rebellions, right? Uh, and of course, this is the argument that, well, you know, everything has its good side and its bad side, that kind of thing. And Gandhi is, again, a little bit, you know, ironical about that because one of the things he argues is that, well, as a consequence of the railways, uh, the bubonic plague has spread in India, right? The bubonic plague has spread in India. What we are going to try to want to consider, and so I have... So this is what I was going to address. I'm going to start with that is what is the relationship of the railways to your own body? To your own body, okay? And is there a meta critique 
of the railways that Gandhi is invested in. I want to just give you a hint of what I mean by that. Speed. What did railways do? As planes are to the 20th century, railways were to the 19th century. But the principle is the same, right? They introduce an element of speed. And we're going to have to consider whether Gandhi has a critique of the whole idea of speed. This fast life that we are all accustomed to. Why do you think that in places such as Italy, they have such things as a slow food movement? You know, there's a slow food movement which says that the only way to eat is you everybody get together, you sit down at a table and make sure you spend three, four hours eating. That doesn't mean you stuff yourself and I have actually in Italy, obesity is not really that big a problem as it is in the US, for example, but it's a rebuke to this whole idea of American fast food, right? See, these are things that are related. There, there is a critique of this element of speed. What does it do to human civilization? That is the meta critique that Gandhi is going to be interested in, in part, and we're going to commence with that in my lecture, first lecture next week.